Kim McClary, President and CEO of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. Thank you so very much for joining us today for this very terrific program. We have launched our annual year-end fundraising drive. We are a very small nonprofit and your contributions are essential to our operations and the production of these live streams, which we are offering for free as a public service. So we can't do this without your support. At the end of this live stream, you'll see a text to give information. And we are so grateful for your support. For those of you who would like to submit questions today, there's a control panel on the right-hand side of your screen where you can type in your questions. Jessica Deganzik, our Vice President of Events, will be managing your questions during the Q&A portion, which will start in about 20 or 25 minutes. It's now my very great pleasure to introduce today's program, a post-election analysis with Professor politics professor Dan Schnur and Jennifer Kavanaugh. Jennifer is a senior political scientist at the RAND Corporation. So Dan and Jennifer, it's time for me to turn this program over to you. Can't wait for this analysis. Well, Kim, thank you so much for having us. And thanks to all of you for joining us for this really interesting, what I think, what I know is going to be a really interesting conversation with Dr. Jennifer Kavanaugh. Jennifer, thank you so much for for joining us today. We know how busy you are and we really appreciate you taking the time. So thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Okay. So I'm sure that a, a, a lot of you, when you saw the marketing for this program, in addition to hopefully recognizing Dr. Kavanaugh's name, but certainly recognizing Rand for the terrific work that they do, you were thinking just what we need another post-election analysis. And for those of you who do need more traditional post-convention analysis, know that we'll continue that discussion, of course, on my weekly webinar this Thursday morning, uh, when we continue the conversation about the election and the, and the transition. But what Jennifer Kavanaugh has done is something much more specific, and frankly, something that you're not going to have seen on cable TV or in the major news uh, papers or, or news platforms. Because what she has studied, and I'll, I'll, I will let her tell you about it in just a moment, is studied the the logistics of putting on an election during a pandemic. Because most of you, like me, were not around in 1918, the last time this challenge faced us. It was for all practical purposes and unprecedented challenges not for this country, but for state and local governments across the country. And Dr. Jennifer Kavanaugh and her, uh, uh, has done uh, just a, a, a really interesting study on this. And so Jennifer, I guess my first question is, given all the work you've done in the past, just fascinating work, many of you, have, many of our, our, our members have seen your work on the seminal tooth decay, a truth decay study that you put out last year. What made you decide to take on this particular topic? Because I find it so interesting, but I have to admit it wouldn't have occurred to me. So what made you decide this is something you wanted to do? Well, this work is part of our Truth Decay or Countering Truth Decay initiative. And the reason that we took it on was because we're really interested in trust in institutions. A rebuilding trust is core to our ability to counter truth decay. If people don't know where to turn for fact-based, reliable information, they're more likely to turn to unreliable sources. And the government traditionally has been one of those sources that people have trusted. So we're really interested in this broader question of trust. And when it comes to how we build trust in the government, one of the key ways is through elections. Elections give us an opportunity to have a say in our own government. And if people don't believe that the elections themselves are legitimate, then that leads to down a, a tricky path of the government itself not having legitimacy and people then having further uh, doubts about whether or not they can trust the government for fact-based information. We know that trust in government and other institutions like the media has been on the decline for several decades. And so any further uh, decline in that level of trust would be really problematic. So when we were faced then in March with the prospect of conducting elections in the context of a pandemic, um, my colleagues and I were concerned. Um, and we were concerned because elections are hard even in the best of circumstances. There's a ton of variables that have to be um, accounted for, a lot of logistics, um, we already know uh, that there were people who were concerned in 2016 about claims of fraud. 
And so now we're trying to do all of this in, in a situation in which we're telling people, don't go out unless you have to, and stay away from other people. Those are two things that are hard to do in the context of an in-person voting um, experience. So we really wanted to provide policymakers with a set of tools that would help them think through the challenges of conducting an election in the COVID-19 context. And that meant thinking about what are the different options for registering people and then having people vote, um, given that we want to try to promote both the integrity of the election, make sure that we have the security and legitimacy that we need um, on that dimension, but also make sure that we're protecting people's physical health safety by promoting ways that they can vote without exposing themselves to unnecessarily to, um, to COVID-19 or raising their risk of contracting um, the, that virus. And so that's really why we took on that, this challenge. Well, so not just fascinating, but critically important because of course there was so much misinformation going around about what could be done and what could not be done, what could be done safely and what could not be done safely in the aspect, uh, in, the, in the context of voting, either on election day or early voting. Before we go on, just a, 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 a quick note, uh, because Jennifer correctly mentioned, of course, that this is part of a broader truth decay effort that she has spearheaded at RAND. And she and her team have just done phenomenal work. So I'd strongly, strongly encourage all of you who are not familiar with it to go to the RAND website and to look for their, to look for their, uh, their research and their findings, because it's really terrific stuff. In fact, if I'm not withstanding, Jennifer, uh, no less a figure than President Barack Obama talked about uh, the truth decay work over the weekend. That had to feel pretty good. Yes, uh, the, for the first time he referenced the book was in 2018. After it came out, he put it on his summer reading list. Um, so we knew that he was aware of it, but in his recent interviews about his book, which comes out tomorrow, um, he was again using the phrase. So that's obviously um, really um, uh, great that someone of his stature has um, recognized also the problem and using our term to describe it. Okay, so maybe this is the first step to getting to, onto Oprah's book club list, and then we could really skyrocket upwards. But I want to get back to the substance of, of this report. You've, you've helped us understand why this topic was so important. Tell us a little bit, again, given all the misinformation circulating throughout the election year, tell us a little bit about your findings, if you would. Sure. Well, one thing that we really wanted to do, which I think is distinct for the work that we did, was we wanted it to be nonpartisan. So a lot of the actors who are working on election issues have uh, an agenda either on the left or the right, and we really wanted to be as objective as possible, um, not necessarily to make specific recommendations, but to lay out the options for policymakers. So we did three sort of lines of research. The first focused on looking at state voting laws and understanding how easily different states could shift to remote and distributed processes. So that would be early voting or remote voting. The reason we focused on that was because those were the ways that states could best distribute the risk um, in terms of public health. Um, what we found there was that about three-fifths of states, so about 60% of states, were pretty well positioned. They fell into our high and moderate categories. And we judged these categories based on whether or not states had one policy or another. So it was as objective as possible. And the other 20% or other 40%, excuse me, that we found um, fell somewhere below. Um, and so they were ones that tended to be more focused on in-person um, processes. And so we assessed that the, their challenge in terms of conducting this election would be higher. Now, many of those states in responding to COVID-19 um, shifted to having uh, no excuse remote voting or made other changes to their traditional processes along the lines that we would have suggested in our framework, um, not because of our framework, but along those lines. Um, so, you know, I think that, that that was one way they managed the risk. And I think that shows the ways in which our report was um, an effective metric or a way to judge states' preparedness. Um, we also laid out uh, the different options, different types of uh, registration and voting options in terms of their safety risk for public, um, public health, um, their risk for legitimacy. So um, how likely is fraud under these different types of, of, of uh, processes? Um, the key observation there is that fraud overall, the risk is just so infinitesimal um, that even if you're talking about online, um, not online, um, well, we did look at online voting, but um, voting by mail, still the risk very low. The only place you get into any kind of concerns about security would be if we are talking about online voting, um, where the risk is um, significantly higher. But that's one of the reasons why we don't do it yet, because we don't have the infrastructure to support it. 
Um, and then logistical risk, um, just how hard is it to do? There's a million things that election officials have to think about. If you think about doing in-person elections, that's getting sanitation supplies, um, getting PPE. Um, how are you going to sanitize all the equipment? How are you going to keep people apart? How are you going to manage the line? All these different things that they have to think about. Similarly, on um, remote voting, do you have the machines to process? Who's going to process? Where are they going to process it? Lots of questions to answer. So we tried to lay those out. And then the final piece that we looked at was looking at voter attitudes. Um, and there we asked about their, uh, their perceptions of safety and their perceptions of integrity. And the key takeaway there is just a lot of uncertainty. People weren't sure what to think, even right up to the election, um, and a pretty significant shift to mail-in voting from people who said they voted in person in 2016 who are going to vote by mail um, in 2020. So let me pick up on that last point, because I think it's a really, really interesting one and a really important one. Um, already, even pre-COVID, there have been all sorts of concerns in the various uh, portions of the electorate about voting integrity. And it sounds like, if anything, if I understand you right, that the process of voting in a pandemic exacerbated those concerns, particularly in minority communities and communities of color. Is that right? Well, the pandemic exacerbated concerns about access and about um, integrity in a couple of ways. Um, in terms of access, uh, the pandemic just made everything harder. It makes it harder to get out, makes it harder to use public transportation. It means that the same spaces can hold fewer people. Um, and these, these concerns often affect um, poor communities and minority communities more because they tend to have fewer polling places and to be more dependent on things like public transportation to get to their um, voting location. Um, in terms of then um, the legitimacy angle, um, I think that there, there are a number of ways in which um, pe people have concerns that mail-in voting has a higher rate of fraud, that there's a number of things that could happen um, during a mail-in vote process that would um, compromise the integrity of the election that you wouldn't have if you voted in person. Um, in reality, the research suggests that the risk is slightly higher, but you're still talking on the minuscule scale. So still, compared to the volume of ballots cast, that risk is just still uh, really, really low. Um, but I think that the, the fact that it happened in a pandemic and that uh, states were forced to radically shift their processes in a very short period of time created a lot of challenges that raised people's concerns and opened the door for disinformation about the integrity of the election. So things like ballots not arriving on time or ballots arriving in the wrong places or with the wrong addresses, like mistakes happen. And these mistakes were exacerbated by the fact that states had to respond on such a short timeline in ways that they hadn't before. States that had done very little vote by mail were now doing almost entirely vote by mail. Uh, and that combined with disinformation around the uh, the integrity and legitimacy, I think, did raise people's concerns. Okay. Um, and again, just to go a little bit deeper on that, if I understand correctly, those were the concerns were uh, especially notable in underrepresented communities and communities mm -hmm. of color. Is that right? Yes, that's true. The concerns about integrity were much higher for uh, minorities and um, communities of color in our in our survey analysis. And in reality, that makes sense. Um, those voters are the ones who have historically experienced the most systemic uh, exclusion from the voting process um, and the ones who may have the most concerns about their vote being counted. So we saw that uncertainty um, increase and those voters were among the least likely to vote by mail, um, probably because they were used to voting in person and with all the information over the summer about um, concerns about the Postal Service being able to handle the volume of ballots, voting in person just seemed like a safer way to those voters to make sure that their vote was counted. Okay. And so you also touched, uh, for just a, for, for, for a moment, on the, on the question of logistics of states needing to change the rules in order to allow for greater access to mail voting and in other types of early voting. Generally speaking, in this country, we've seen a lot of these types of debates devolve down to a blue versus red argument. Um, but if I'm not mistaken, and I'd, I'd love to, I think we'd love to hear more broadly about what the states did in order to make sure their voters had a chance to cast ballots. But what I found particularly interesting is that even states that would generally be considered to be fairly conservative made considered efforts to expand voting access uh, under these circumstances too, correct? Yes, I think that that is correct. Um, so, you know, I think the a lot of states, I think we found that um, 
probably almost 20 states made some kind of modification. Um, and for states that could, for, for states that were already pretty well positioned, that included things like sending mail in ballots to all registered voters. Um, so that happened in California, it happened in Washington, D.C., which were already states that had um, a pretty adaptable processes. Um, the most common change among a lot of states was to shift from uh, a vote by mail system that required an excuse to one that did not. So in states like Arkansas, uh, Connecticut, um, uh, Massachusetts, these are states where typically in previous elections, you had to have a, a set of one, an excuse among that fell onto a set of approved excuses to vote by mail. And this year, anyone could vote by mail. So that was the most common change. Other changes that were made included things like removing the notary or witness requirement, uh, which makes sense in a pandemic context, because if you're going to let someone vote by mail, but require them to then get a witness or get their ballot notarized, you're not actually reducing the in-person contact because they still have to get the um, ballot notarized. Um, some states shifted deadlines to provide themselves more time. So they would allow um, postmark by election day rather than received by election day deadlines. Uh, so states made a, a wide range of different types of modifications also to early voting. It's expanded early voting, expanded early voting hours or expanded early voting days. Um, and this really didn't vary that, uh, we didn't see a, like a red blue breakdown in terms of states that did and that didn't make modifications. Um, states did vary in, their, in, in whether they got tangled in lawsuits. So some states made these changes without any type of problem. Other states, you saw extensive litigation around those challenges with various outcomes, places like Wisconsin or Pennsylvania. So particularly in more uh, historically restrictive states, do you get the impression that these were one-off changes given the nature of the emergency caused by the pandemic? Or do you feel like these trends are going to continue into the future? In other words, do you see a retreat once the virus has, has, has passed? Or is this now where we're headed? Well, I think it depends a little bit on the state politics. I mean, I think the fact that the election went off without any major issues, um, you know, there was, the day was pretty peaceful. There were no major reports of uh, election day problems, um, no major incidents of fraud. Um, you had the Homeland Security come out last week and say it was the securest election in history. So the fact that they made these changes and they ha and the election went off without any problems um, will be one argument that's used to suggest that they sh these changes should remain. Uh, we had the highest voter turnout in history. Um, in a democracy, we should want high turnout. We want people to participate. Um, so in theory, if we can do it safely, then we should, um, we should let these things uh, remain. Um, of course, we know that in government, sometimes decisions are made based on political preferences or kind of partisan disagreements rather than on um, kind of those um, you know, fact-based analysis, which is what Rand is promoting. Um, so certainly it's possible that some of these policies will be retrenched. Um, most policy changes were written pretty carefully to apply only to 2020. So there's not really any indication that they are um, you know, from the get-go intending to extend them. Um, but the other thing is that it, once you give somebody something, it's hard to take it back. Um, so the question is whether there'll be public pressure um, to keep those things in place now that people have had them once. Um, how do you then not offer it again in the future? So um, I think that remains to be seen that it's definitely something that we at RAND are looking at in some of our continuing work on this topic is what lessons can we learn and what do we think will remain from this election uh, that will extend into the future even after COVID-19 is um, hopefully gone or less of a problem. I don't know well, what you, to say at this point <laughs> about that. Well, I, I promise not to ask you for predictions on COVID's future. I know that's <laughs> Thank a, you. an area of focus. Um, but let me ask you this. You talk about, correctly of course, about the extremely high turnout and many people were surprised by how smoothly things ran, as you said. We'd been hearing for quite some time about the possibility for absolute meltdown on election day, either infiltration of voting systems, overwhelmed, uh, overwhelmed polling places. All in all, a high turnout election that moved smoothly that our intelligence services say is the most secure in history, sounds like it came out all right. Were you surprised? I mean, to be honest, I didn't really expect there to be any any major problems. Uh, maybe that's because I'm naive or optimistic or because I was just not wanting to think about the negative possible outcomes. But I mean, 
I saw the the efforts that states were taken to taking to prepare. I mean, we had the the primary elections, which is when the primaries did not go smoothly in a lot of states. And I think um, places like Washington D.C., um, Georgia, they learned a lot of lessons from the from the um, the the primary context, um, mistakes that were made, so they could uh, prepare more smoothly. They had a lot more lead time. Um, I guess my biggest concern was sort of on the back end, whether states would have the resources needed to process and count that many um, absentee ballots, and we did see it take a long time. Um, and so I think that that was one thing that I was concerned about was how long it would take. Um, uh, but I guess I wasn't, um, I, I guess I had pretty high hopes, um, given the fact that as we moved through primary season, states seemed to be getting better at adapting. Uh, we saw a pretty smooth early voting season in terms of lots of people were voting early, lots of ballots turned in early. Um, early voting had some hiccups at the beginning, but tended to smooth out. So things seemed to be really trending in, in that direction. And I had confidence that you know the investments that had been made in election security on the intel community side would um, hopefully prevent any sort of um, foreign interference so um you know and i also didn't really believe a lot of the dire predictions about election violence um so um i guess um, i wasn't all that surprised on the back end though the counting um, i will admit that although i was telling people it's going to take a while you have to prepare to be patient you won't know right away um, it felt a lot different um, than I expected it to. It was a lot, the uncertainty was a lot more unsettling and uncomfortable. And I think that that's something that, um, I don't know how um, we could have prepared ourselves better for that period, um, but I do think that that was probably the period that was the least like my expectations, even though co cognitively I knew that's what it would be. But even, but even on the expectations of vote counting, I have to say public opinion polling done throughout the fall shows a really remarkable shift in terms of public understanding and public expectations. Mm -hmm. I remember back in August seeing a poll that showed that 25 to 30 percent of the public understood that we might not have results on Tuesday night. And what an alarming figure that was. By mid-October, that was 75, 80 percent. So while it wasn't complete, it appears that you and others made tremendous progress in helping people understand the, uh, the, the unique situation we we're facing. Yeah, I do think there was a lot of progress, um, and I do think that that was definitely helpful. Um, and I do think that, um, you know, I think the media did a reasonably good job of setting people's expectations uh, around that that specific uh, context. Um, and I also think the vote county went pretty smoothly. I mean, it it did take a while, but I I, I do think that they that many of the states that took a long time did a good job of being transparent about where they were, where the counties were, the ballots still existed, how many they had counted today, when they would update people again. And I think that was really important. Well, and even and even and even given the post-election yeah, arguments going on, it does appear that the states are moving forward in a very impressive way. Georgia's, I think, roughly halfway through their recount. And it's becoming less certain as to whether recounts in other states are going to happen are going to happen at all. Jennifer, mm -hmm. I want to ask one more question mm -hmm. uh, before we bring Jessica in, and this conversation becomes much more interesting because of questions not just from me, but from our very, very smart audience. But my last question gets back to the question of, of uh, the, the point of turnout that you were making a minute or two ago. Mm -hmm. Underlying these did this debate over turnout that we've watched for many, many years has been the supposition that a higher turnout helps Democratic candidates and disadvantages Republicans because a higher turnout presumes larger participation from young people, from underrepresented communities and minority communities, and others who are less uh, regular less regular voters. And this is an argument that's been made not just by Democrats, but by Republican partisans as well. Um, after this election, that turnout set of assumptions is it nearly as clear as we thought it is, is it? No, I mean, I think that the, the common belief that high turnout helps Democrats is a little bit misleading if you look at some of the you know, academic research on the topic, which suggests that that's, the story is much more nuanced. And I think the reason that we fall into this trap of, of thinking that um, high turnout benefits one party or the other is because we often think of large blocks of voters as one mass. Um, like all young people will vote one way and all minority voters will vote one way and in reality the story is much more complex there's a number of different factors that um that affect how people vote on um, age 
uh, race, education, economic status, where you live, your religion, your background, what your friends are doing. Um, and I think we saw that most um, clearly when we look at the, um, the Hispanic vote this time. Um, people think um, you know, it will go one way. And in reality, that's a, kind of a very strange way to think about a community that is incredibly diverse um, with people with really varied backgrounds from many different countries. Um, uh, and uh, so I think that uh, when we when we actually get down to it, when we think about these um, the actual distribution of people's attitudes, it doesn't fall that neatly along the lines of you know people who of, of you know young people minorities. It's much more complicated, and so that means that when turnout is high, um, the benefits are more mixed across both parties. And I think that this election was a really clear demonstration of that fact, which uh, has you know which underlies a lot of uh, of existing literature, but which often gets distorted then in the popular narrative. And if we're really, really, really lucky, maybe this can departisanize to some degree the discussion of voter access and in, 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 uh, in voter participation, but that might be a little bit too much to hope for, at least, at least in the immediate. So this is the point in the program where I uh, reluctantly end my monopoly uh, with you, Jennifer, and Jessica Deganzik is going to join us, and with her she brings I'm guessing a boatload of questions from our from our audience. So, yeah. Jessica, shall we shall we have at it? Sure. Well, and and first of all, um, before I get started, I just want to send a thank you to Joel Mogi and Joanne Mogi, who are both big supporters of both the council and Rand, and were instrumental in bringing together today's event. So, thank you to them. I think they're they're watching today. Um, and just to jump into the questions, yes, thank you, Joel and Joanne. <laughs> Um, so we have several people asking about, do you think there might be a move in Congress at some point to make it so that each state has a similar voting process rather than every state having disparate processes? Well, I think that it, there would be benefits to having uh, one single voting process, um, both in terms of helping um, set expectations for people. It can be very confusing if you move from state to state or trying to understand all the, the web of different laws. I think it'll be hard though, uh, because uh, voting procedures have traditionally been um, the, under the purview of the states. And so it would mean taking something away from state control. Um, we know from history that that can be very difficult, that states tend to be very protective of their rights and very resistant to attempts to federalize. Um, and I think you can see the, the kind of fierce protection at the state level just in, in the way in which each state's legislation has evolved over time um, and the kind of historical roots of that. I think it's interesting when you dig into a, a specific state's uh, voting procedures and processes um, to see some things that appear surprising based on what you would expect from a state, you know, a state that um, that you think of as a kind of a blue state that has very restrictive um, voting um, laws, and that's because of kind of its historical, how it evolved. It may have previously been a red state, or it may have been a red state at the time of its constitution being written. So there are certain like vestiges of, of, uh, of that, or it may just be a state that has a really old constitution and the way we vote has changed, but those constitutional um, provisions carry forward. So um, I think it would be beneficial in some ways, but I think it will be very difficult um, to do in the current political context. I, I agree with you, Jennifer, but I'm actually a, a bit more optimistic, only because even in a federalist system where states tend to make these types of decisions, there is precedent in other areas for the federal government not mandating state action, but rather incentivizing it. And I think the, the, the best uh, precedent I can think of is uh, the drinking age which when I was growing up, and Jessica, way, way before your time, uh, the drinking age in many states was 18 rather than 21. And it was becoming a particular challenge in states bordering other states with higher drinking ages, people between 18 and 21, driving across state lines to drink and then driving home to often tragic consequences. The federal government couldn't mandate uh, a national drinking age but they incentivized it with immense amounts of federal highway funds. And I wonder, and Jennifer, if you see any path for this, if there's a way, again, not, not for a mandate, but the federal government to incentivize states 
to sign on to a uniform set of standards without actually requiring it. Yes, I could see that as being a possibility. Um, I guess uh, the challenge there would be making sure that there was some, still some kind of bipartisan commitment to this so that it would endure across administrations. Um, something like this is probably you know, something that you could work to over a four-year administration, um, but you would need to then have that continuity um, or it would just kind of lapse. And so I think this all kind of goes back to um, the need for this kind of bipartisan consensus and agreement on a set of, of principles, um, which is not impossible, especially in an area like voting, um, which is sort of core to our democracy, um, but still, I think a little bit of a challenge. Thank you. Um, why are people so confused about where to get facts? What are people taught in schools about where to look for information? If they are taught about it, why are so many people confused about reliable sources and in understanding differences between opinions and facts? Well, I think here the key thing to understand is the dramatic changes that have occurred in the information system and the information ecosystem over the past 10 to 15 years. And so you have to think about a couple of different groups of people. So first of all, there are the people who didn't grow up with the internet, didn't grow up with social media, didn't grow up with the current, um, the current diversity in the media landscape. Um, and so it can seem foreign at times. Um, the way that the media has changed has really promoted this blurring of the line between fact and opinion, which is one of the core characteristics of what we call truth decay. Um, and that can make it really tricky for even an observant and informed reader to distinguish between what's a fact and what's not. Um, you see this even in mainstream newspapers um, the, and in the volume of commentary um, that exists um, as compared to the amount of you know, fact-based investigative journalism. Um, the internet is one thing driving this. Um, that has led to a, a dramatic change in the economics of the media industry, um, which also drives it. Um, so for those people who grew up um, and went to school before all of this existed, um, that's, that can be one of the challenges they face. Now for people in school, the a set of challenges is sort of different. Um, there, um, you face the challenges of the different uh, rate of change. So uh, technology and information changes really quickly. You can see a dramatic revolution in the information space in just a short period of time. But institutions like schools, especially schools because of the parochial interests, change really slowly. And so even as the information system is changing, the ability of curricula to adapt to those changes and to develop really effective and targeted ways of teaching students uh, media literacy skills that they would need to navigate the online world um, take a while to catch up. So schools are doing a lot to, um, to fill this gap, um, but that doesn't change the fact that the gap exists and that the challenges are hard. So students um, leave school, sometimes not fully prepared to navigate a really complex um, online world. Um, so it's partly a, a demand issue. It's partly on the on the side of the of the user um, in terms of not having those skills, and it's partly on the side of the media in terms of the information that's out there being misleading and confusing, even for somebody who has the skills they need. But I would like to emphasize that there's a lot of energy around this concept of media literacy, and I see lots of improvements um, and efforts by organizations to work together to tackle this challenge. Um, developing better resources for teachers, um, better evaluation so we can know how students are doing. Um, it's definitely an area where improvement is still needed and it's a, a, definitely an area where we can look for solutions to truth decay, um, but it's also a kind of a long-term challenge that's not gonna be fixed overnight. Okay. And Jessica, I know we have a lot of questions, but just to add on to Jennifer's analysis, there's actually a considerable amount of research that shows that for all the reasons she mentioned, uh, young people, uh, millennials and Gen Z are actually much better at differentiating between accurate information and, if you will, fake news online simply because they are digital natives as opposed to having learned these skills the way some of us older people have. And, and Jennifer's most important point, I think, for all of us is that it is a longer term effort. You know, civics education here in California and elsewhere uh, in this country is woefully um, under uh, 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 under examined and presented. Uh, the average, uh, most high school students in this state take one single semester of civics, uh, 15 weeks of civics, government, and geography. 
all crammed into one semester in their junior or senior year of high school. And I wonder if uh, the inadvertent message we send to the next generation of leaders is that we tell them this democracy stuff is so unimportant to you, we're not going to bother to teach it to you for your first 10 years of school. But then we want you to turn around magically in 18 months and become a responsible citizen and reliable voter. And given the challenges that Jennifer's articulated, we simply have to do a better job of equipping that next generation of leaders with the tools they need to navigate the path that Jennifer is, is outlined. Thank you. Um, how did you assess potential flaws or problems in voting software and code like Dominion or Smartmatic when their code is proprietary? And also about network integrity and the risk of hackers or outside or foreign interference. So we did not look specifically at the code or software behind voting, um, vote counting software or um, things like that. That was a little bit out of scope of this specific effort. Um, we did look a little bit at the risk of hackers um, and foreign interference. Um, and we built off of some work that my colleague Quentin, um, who was the co-author on the reports, um, that he looked at um, a, as part of his work for the Department of Homeland Security. And so there, um, where we focus is trying to understand what are the high risk uh, points in the election infrastructure. Um, and those are really points where um, a, a hacker or a, a foreign adversary could affect a large number of votes at once. Um, and so those are places like if they hack into say the voting rolls um, and manipulate um, who's registered and who's not. Um, that could have a significant effect. Um, the ability to hack into um, kind of online voting software, that would be an area where we would assess the risk to be higher. Um, um, that's why online voting is considered to be very risky because the risk of someone hacking in, the, the, the threat of foreign interference is much higher. Um, but in terms of things like mailing out ballots or collecting ballots or um, some of the other aspects of the voting process where sure someone could have an impact but the impact would be much smaller on a smaller number of ballots the risk would be assessed to be much lower so we did in the work try to identify those points that we would be vulnerable and where the risk or the damage done by um, foreign interference would be the highest um, but that was that was sort of how we um, incorporated that um, was to rate the potential for that along vo different voting um, methods or mechanisms. Thank you. Um, a lot of people are asking this question. I don't know if you can answer it, but what do we do in a situation where the president refuses to concede and he and his party refuse to transfer power? Well, I think that it's still pretty early in this process of kind of watching the post-election um, proceedings. Um, we there, there are legal uh, procedures in place for um, candidates to challenge the elections. Um, certainly, we would hope that, you know, ultimately that we will be able to have an efficient and effective uh, transfer of power. Um, the reasons for that are, are many, um, including most importantly, um, you know, national security. Um, periods of transition are risk, are, are risk areas um, in national security because we know that our adversaries like to target us when we're weak. Um, periods where power is being transferred are periods where adversaries often try to test new leaders and take advantage of gaps and weaknesses. Obviously, COVID-19 really complicates that. So I do think that um, having a peaceful transfer of power is essential. Um, I also, I guess, have greater confidence and faith in our institutions and processes that ultimately um, that will happen, although certainly it has been delayed thus far. Um, I think the Biden-Harris uh, uh, administration's approach thus far has been to just proceed with their planning to the best of their ability. Um, there's many resources that they can draw on to make progress on the things they need to do um, right away while this plays out. Um, but certainly I would say that this is um, kind of a risky moment um, and kind of the, the future um, integrity of democracy does depend on our ability to have that peaceful transfer of power. I don't know if Dan has thoughts on this question. Just, just very quickly, because I want to make sure you get as many questions as we have time for, Jennifer. But I think it is important to recognize that I think all of you know who are regular participants in our programs, that LA World Affairs Council Town Hall works very, very hard to be nonpartisan or bipartisan or multipartisan, if you will, not to take sides 
And it is worth noting, though, that respected Democrats and respected Republicans have both called on the Trump administration, even while they contest the election results, to begin to facilitate uh, the potential for, to, to work with the Biden transition effort. Because even if those challenges ultimately end up being successful, it's a good insurance policy to know that a new president and a new administration comes into office as well equipped to deal with these challenges as possible. And those are calls that we're hearing from, from, across, from across party lines. For those of you who are greatly concerned, I'll remind you of a point we discussed last Thursday, that while we in the modern era have generally taken the network's calls and the Associated Press's calls to be an official designation, technically, while it's customary, it's not official. And starting this Friday, when the state of Georgia certifies its election results, between this Friday and the first week of December, most or all of the states in the country, certainly all of the key contested states, will officially certify their election results. And so over the next few days, over the next week or two, we'll be shifting from an unofficial conclusion about the election to official conclusions, at which time the challenges that Jennifer has talked about become much more daunting. And lastly, it's worth remembering that once all of the states have concluded their individual certification process, on December 12th is when they convey to Washington the identity of their electors, Democrat, Republican, or otherwise. So we're just on the precipice now of several major steps. And obviously, we'll talk about this in our other programming um, in the weeks ahead. Thank you. Uh, this questioner says, I'm curious about the Truth Decay initiative. Are you planning to utilize AI and machine learning to analyze billions of data in trying to arrive to facts and truth? Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, we already have um, done a little bit of that and we plan to do more. So our first uh, follow on report, which was published last year, uh, was looking at how news reporting has changed over time. Um, and to do that, we used um, a machine learning tool that is a text analysis tool um, that allows us to study the, the style and tone um, and content of uh, you know, millions of words. Um, and we couldn't do that by hand unless we uh, set aside a few years, um, but we were able to do it pretty quickly with this software. And it allowed us to observe um, how things change over time and how things are different across platforms. And so what we found there was that over time, uh, we do see a shift from more objective reporting to more subjective reporting. Um, but that the overtime change is uh, newspapers and broadcast television is much smaller than the change we observe between uh, traditional media, so broadcast television and newspapers, and what I'm going to call new media, so, um, online journalism like Huffington Post or Politico, and um, uh, cable television, CNN, Fox News, MSNBC. Um, and so that change that we see across um, from traditional to new to new media is picked up by this machine learning software. So what we're doing now is we've taken this software and we're trying to improve it and make it more user friendly. Um, before it wasn't very user friendly. I can say from personal experience that it was very kind of clunky. And um, now we're trying to make it something that we can share with other researchers and journalists to help them um, do some of the same analyses to help us understand some of these trends, um, understand how the use of different types of words um, and uh, different types of emotions, anger, advocacy, how that changes. Um, and that will help us get at some of these underlying problems and to suggest solutions about how uh, journalists might convey their information in different ways to help people navigate this boundary between fact and opinion. Thank you. Um, we had a couple of questions about this too. Why do minority communities tend to have fewer polling places and has this changed since 2013? Well, a lot of it is historical. Um, states make their own decisions about where polling places are located. Um, we know that uh, some states have history of suppressing uh, minority vote. Um, minority communities are often less able to advocate for themselves. They don't have the same access to uh, the people who hold the power that make those decisions. And so they may end up getting um, getting fewer uh, polling places than a place that has um, more direct connection to the seat of power. Um, and they also may have kind of fewer resources um, in when we get down to the jurisdictional level uh, 
to, to provide those types of resources. Um, I do think that this is improving over time, uh, but again, this is a problem that is, you know, goes back hundreds of years um, uh, in, in terms of the roots of, of systemic racism and voter suppression. Um, so again, it's something that takes a long time to turn around. Thank you. Um, again, going back to the, the election, what about using blockchain technology for voting versus going back to all paper and extending the number of voting days, including making it a national holiday? Please comment. Um, so those are all uh, great suggestions that have been uh, proposed by various parties. Um, I've been at seminars with people who insist that paper voting is the only way to go because it's the only way to do a 100% sure audit of all the voting. Um, I've also been at seminars with people who advocate for blockchain technologies. Um, I think that the larger community around um, voting and uh, information security are still pretty skeptical of the blockchain um, uh, voting systems in the sense that they still would be pretty vulnerable to uh, foreign hackers or domestic hackers or anybody who wanted to interfere with the election. Um, because when you get into these on, totally online systems, they're just, they're, it's just much easier to have a really wide scale um, effect. Um, so I think that that's certainly a potential. I'd love to see online voting. That would certainly make everyone's life easier, but I think we're not quite there yet in terms of the information security. Similarly, I'm not sure that an all paper approach is necessarily the most eff efficient or the best way. Paper um, ballots can be easily destroyed um, and easily impacted by other types of factors. Um, so, so in terms of kind of an either or, in reality, I think the current system is uh, confusing because there's so many options, but also good because there's so many options. Having many different options and ways of voting is a useful way to make sure that everybody has uh, a way that they can vote um, or a way that they feel comfortable voting. Uh, and different states are going to choose different approaches, um, at least for now, because they have different risk level and different resource level, different electorate, different jurisdictions. So there's many reasons why having a varied system, um, a varied system can be can be uh, can be so effective. Um, I'm forgetting the second set of things that were listed. Jessica, can you remind me of the rest of the oh, questions? Sure. Uh, yeah. So so uh, extending the number of days that people can vote and also making voting a national holiday. Yeah. So on making voting a national holiday, I agree that would be great. Um, countries that do that tend to get higher turnout. Some countries also have make voting mandatory. Um, but certainly for a large portion of the country, especially in previous elections where we weren't working from home and uh, where um, voting by mail was much harder for a larger number of states, um, having that day off to be able to make sure you get to the polls and have time to wait would be um, valuable. It would also send a really important signal about the importance of voting and participating in our democracy, which goes back to Dan's point about communicating the value and importance of, of civics and democracy. Um, and then in terms of extending the number of days that people can vote, um, you know, some states really already have really extended um, that uh, to, a, to a great degree. So some states have up to 45 days of early voting. Um, and so that is a, a lot of possible days when you can vote in person or vote by mail um, as well. Um, some states have much shorter voting periods, um, early voting periods. But this was actually one thing that we did assess as part of our flexibility score was how many days of early voting states had. Um, our argument being that more days meant you could spread people out over more locations. Um, not only does that reduce the logistical challenge to an extent, but it also um, reduces the public health risk because you have fewer people showing up on any given day. Um, so I think that both of those latter two changes would be positive ones. Um, and Dan will recall, obviously, about a month or two ago, we were talking incessantly about the post office and the post office risks. And somebody asked, did the post office process and machine modifications ultimately impact election results? Um, I mean, I, I'll maybe throw this over to Dan, um, if, if you all were talking about this. I, the only thing I thought was that there were some, you know, a, a good number of ballots that were kind of missing. And there was some question about whether or not um, the Postal Service had uh, correctly processed all the ballots. Um, I, I w don't, I don't have a good answer to whether or not this impacted the outcome. I don't know if that's something we can ever know, but maybe Dan has some ideas. Well, just quickly, and Jennifer, you're right. We'll, we'll never know for sure, but there's already considerable evidence that there are thousands of ballots um, that were not delivered in time. By the, uh, by the Postal Service to be counted by the deadlines that the states 
uh, to where they had been mailed, uh, to which they had been mailed, um, you know, whose rules it allowed. Um, there's no evidence that there were enough to impact the outcome in any of the key contested states. But there's no question that there were thousands and thousands of ballots that weren't delivered either by election day or by the deadline that the state had set. Uh, happily, like I said, at least so far, it doesn't appear with impact on the overall outcome. Thank you so much. Um, somebody asked, almost all states have now counted 99% of their ballots, with the exceptions of California, 96%, New Jersey, 94%, and New York, 81%. Why is this? Why is it that all the other states have counted all of their ballots or why are these three states so slow? I think why are these three states so slow? Well, um, California just has millions of ballots. I mean, I think it's hard to it's hard to understand the scale or the number of ballots that they get um, every year. California is always the last one to count all their ballots. And I think that just partly has to do with volume it also has to do with how many mail-in ballots they get, even um, even pre-COVID. Tons of people in California vote by mail. You all you all live out there, so you know. Um, but it's just a massive number of ballots compared to other states. Um, in terms of, do you want to say something, Dan? Oh, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. I was going to say, you know, New Jersey, New Jersey, and New York are different um, systems. Um, you know, New York had a lot of problems in its primary election too. Um, their election administration seems to be a little bit inefficient um, in terms of the vote counting and to have some other types of hiccups. They had them even in the um, even in the primary election and even in the lead up to the general election, some mishaps with votes, ballots going to the wrong places. So there it, it just seems a little bit slow. Um, and that's unfortunate, um, especially for the continuing uncalled races um, in the House. I mean, I do think that having elections called reasonably quickly, not on election night, but you know within a week, um, does help promote confidence. Um, and so I do think that, you know, this is a, an area that can, we can work on in the future in terms of increasing people's confidence and legitimacy of elections is making sure that states have the resources they need to count, um, to count in, in a reasonable amount of time. Um, another thing to consider is that states vary in whether or not they're allowed to start counting their ballots before election day. So for some states they are, and for other states they have to wait until after election day to start. And so obviously that slows down the process. Dan? Yeah, the one thing I'd add quickly is uh, Jennifer, of course, provides, I think, an expert national overview. Here in California, in addition to the size of the state, this is actually as a result of very specific decisions made by the California state legislature um, in order to make sure that every possible ballot gets counted. Uh, this California now extends the deadline for vote counting until 17 full days after the election. And what that means is if you are a local official overseeing the process, you don't have to rush through the process the way other states require. If you know you've got two weeks plus to do it, you don't have to pull all-nighters and work all weekends. Yeah, you know, there's an ongoing argument about whether uh, that additional uh, time, the benefits of that ad additional time outweigh the, the waiting period that comes with it. At least this year, it looks like most of the state's contested races, not, not all, have been settled, settled in a shorter time frame than usual. But if you're watching the uh, uh, Smith-Garcia race, for example, up in the 25th district, by now you might be wondering when they are going to get done counting, and the answer is uh, November 20th is, is is the final deadline. Thank you so much. And this will be my final question. I'll turn it back over to Dan. Um, do you see more scrutiny in swing states and less in states where it's assumed that votes will go to one party? Well, I think there's certainly more external scrutiny on the states that where where the voting is close. Um, you know, once a, when, for states where the voting um, is skewed one direction or the other, I think there's less attention. Um, and, and I think that that makes sense because, you know, if there's um, 100 ballots that are contested in a state that uh, went one way by a few hundred thousand, then, you know, it's, it's not really a place where we should focus a lot of attention. So I do think that the scrutiny on all of these questions is much higher in states that we would consider to be battleground states. Um, uh, and I, I mean, I do think that makes sense from the, from the perspective of, of the way our election system works. 
Um, but this then goes back to the concept of, you know, the, the debate about whether or not the electoral college um, versus kind of just having a popular vote, um, which, which way would be the better way to conduct uh, a general election like this. The reason why um, battleground states get so much more scrutiny, why there's so much more money spent on uh, uh, campaigning in those places and why the voting procedures are under the microscope on every ballot is contested is because of the way the electoral college system works in which um, you know, the outcomes of these specific states are the ones that determine how the election goes. Um, but that's a whole separate uh, webinar probably um, <laughs> debate about the electoral college. So I'll, uh, I'll leave that for another day. Well, I look forward to that program and I, I know you're probably working on some very cool stuff. So I'm gonna turn this back over to Dan, but we will definitely wanna have you back. So thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank Dan? you. Thank you, Jessica, and thanks to all of you for your really, really smart questions, as always. And thanks, just to echo Jessica's point earlier, thanks so much to my friend Joel Mogi and the Mogi family for their support, uh, both of RAND and of LA World Affairs Council Town Hall. We don't get to synapse like this nearly as often as I would like to, but hopefully that's something we can do more of in the future. Jennifer, one last question that I'd like to ask you, which probably could be another webinar for another day. So unfortunately, we'll need to address it too briefly today, <laughs> is I guess my last question for you is, what comes next? Whether it's another pandemic, whether it's some type of natural disaster, whether it's some type of other external driven event, this won't be the last time that our election system and election process is dramatically disrupted. What do we learn from 2020 that we can apply, that we can apply going forward? Yeah, that's a great question. It's actually the subject of our continuing work. Um, and I also have to thank uh, Joel and Joanne for their great support, uh, without which we wouldn't really be able to do this work. Um, so we're continuing on to, to try to extract those lessons learned, um, to try to see what can we learn about the resilience of the overall infrastructure uh, that, that we can take forward um, that will be relevant even when there is not a pandemic. Um, I think that we definitely uh, learned some things about, you know, where where are the the weak points in terms of of that resilience. Um, what did we learn in terms of election security? There were a lot of of efforts uh, made to make sure that the election infrastructure was secure from foreign uh, interference, and I think that there are some key lessons there. Um, I think in terms of um, thinking about the uh, the non uh, foreign interference lessons or the other lessons, um, I think this goes back to kind of what we were talking about before: the fact that we were able to conduct elections using a lot of remote and distributed processes, early voting, mail-in voting, to a much greater extent than had been done in the past, and it worked okay. Um, you know, the election went off okay, and I think we can take those lessons um, and build those build some of those procedures in as permanent changes. Um, that have helped more people to get access without increasing the risk of fraud. And so for me, that's the biggest takeaway is that a lot of these changes we made that were criticized for potentially increasing the risk of fraud ended up uh, working out pretty well and contributing to such a high turnout, which I think is a good news story from all perspectives. So from my view, that's the key lesson to take away that I think we can apply to all sorts of future contexts. I'm sure there are more, um, but we're just getting started on that work. So I will look forward to talking about those with you when I come back next time. Well, uh, the one place where I will correct you is I know you're not just getting started on that work because I know in fact that you and your team have a new report coming out tomorrow. So I'll look forward to it today. That's true, and we do have a new report coming out tomorrow. So I would encourage those of you who found today's conversation as interesting as I did, check out the RAND website tomorrow to see what Jennifer and her colleagues are going to be releasing on trusted institutions in our society. And for those of you who want to continue the conversation, not just about the election just passed, but the road forward through the transition and beyond, I hope you'll tune in on Thursday uh, for our regular what weekly webinar at 11 a.m. politics in the time of coronavirus. Dr. Jennifer Kavanaugh, thank you so much for being with us today. Your Truth Decay work has been phenomenal. Uh, learning about your work on this election is fascinating. And we'll hope, as Jessica said, we'll hope to have you back, not just once, but many times in the future. So thanks to you and your whole team at RAND for all the good work you do for all of us. Well, thank you so much for having me. I've enjoyed uh, talking with you. I, the questions were fantastic and I will look forward to coming back.
Jennifer and Dan, this was fabulous. So uh, we'll get you back as soon as we possibly can, Jennifer. We had so many questions for you. So thank you for your time. That was just terrific. For those of you who enjoyed today's program, please help us keep these going. Uh, please text the word give to the number on the screen and give what you can and help us make our annual giving goals. We just do this once a year, so it will all be going on for another couple of weeks. So please give now. We have a terrific lineup of programs. As Dan mentioned, he has his Thursday's politics in the time of coronavirus. So please tune in at 11 o'clock on Thursday. Tomorrow, we have a conversation with the ambassador of the Republic of the Philippines. And Wednesday, Iran and the future generation of activism. So we're starting to integrate more international programming as many of you enjoy. So please go to our website at lawacth.org and register today for these programs. If you're not a member, sign up to become a member and everybody stay safe, stay informed. Jennifer, again, thank you so much. And Dan, we'll see you Thursday. For more